Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the commencement of the Ignatian year. As I think you all know, at this moment, about 500 years ago, almost exactly, Ignatius Loyola changed much in his life and changed the lives of many of us here. So 500 years on, we're delighted to commence this Ignatian year of celebration. I'm Frank Brennan, the present rector of Newman College, and I'm delighted that here this evening to launch the Ignatian year is a previous rector of Newman College, Father Peter Lestrange. Peter concluded his doctoral studies at the University of Oxford in 1991, writing a D. Phil thesis on 19th century British Jesuits and their relationships to the hierarchy. And on his return to Australia, he was then made Rector of Newman College from 1991 to 2005. So we're delighted that he's able to return to the college this evening and make this presentation. And I'm even more pleased to report that at the conclusion, the vote of thanks for the evening will be delivered by another previous rector of Newman College, our beloved scholar in residence, Father William Urene. So without further ado, might I invite Peter Lestrange back to the podium that he knew so well at the past. Uh, the rector, ladies and gentlemen, it's good to be here. <laughs> Let me begin with a story about uh, Brother Ted Storman, a Jesuit known to many of you, who was dean in this college and then later scholar in residence. He taught me theology not far from here. And while he was teaching me theology, he told me a story of his being in Western Australia where he was the rector of uh, University College there, St Thomas More, and he was returning from the country in Western Australia from New Norcia, I think. He wrote a book on the letters of Abbot Salvado. Uh, there's a bit of synergy there because Salvador went from Italy to Western Australia and Ted had come from the West Australian goldfields and to Italy. He was an expert on Dante and he lectured in the English and Italian departments here for years. Each year they brought him back to lecture on Dante. Anyway, he was up in New Norse and he was coming, driving back and his car uh, turned over and the roof was on the road and went along for some time and then it came to a stop and he was upside down and he, he had a near-death experience and his life had flashed before him and he remembered what had happened. The first thing was, are you prepared to meet your maker? Well, I think I am actually. And the next question was, what about St. Ignatius? And he said, no, <laughs> not yet. And I wonder, I wondered then, I still wonder where that is coming from. A recent uh, Jesuit biographer of Ignatius points out that few men in history have accomplished a work of such proportions as Ignatius Loyola did, with results stretching from the Imperial Palace in Peking to the forests of Paraguay, and successfully escaped the fame that their achievement brought them. 
with Benedict and Francis and Dominic, founders of other religious orders, giving their name to their groups. Ignatius didn't give his to the society he founded and didn't even claim to be its founder. It's merged with his creation in a way. And while throughout the world lots of people know about or something about Jesuits, Ignatius himself remains little more than a name. Even when he was declared a saint in 1622, he took second place to Francis Xavier, the best known of his first companions. I'm going to be quite brief tonight because if I lingered on almost any point, we'd be here till dawn. It's a, a lot of territory and a lot of people. But the place I want to begin is um, with a book by Hugo Rana, older brother of Carl, um, St. Ignatius's Letters to Women. There are only about eight or nine of them, but it's a quite a big book because he talks a lot about women in Italy and Spain. Uh, and their place in the 16th century. But he writes this, and it's rather frank. Um, this is German edition 1596, and then an English and German edition 1960. Rana writes, we have still wholly or in part about 7,000 letters of Ignatius. These written words remain and bear witness in all ages to the saint's greatness, both human and spiritual. Only he, and he says he, who has taken the trouble to read and study the 12 volumes of Ignatius's letters in Spanish, Italian, or Latin, is qualified to say anything about the character of this man which is so difficult to understand. We are forced by them to the almost paradoxical conclusion that Ignatius, who was no literary man, who all his life handled the pen with difficulty, and who hid himself behind the awkward sentences of his spiritual exercises and the rough-hewn phraseology of the constitutions of the society, only in his letters, comes alive with that humanity without which there is no holiness in the church of God made man. There are a couple of difficulties um, in talking about Ignatius and the early Jesuits. The first is just the volume of material. Ignatius has the largest correspondent extant of any 16th century figure. None accepted. Larger than Calvin, larger than Erasmus, larger than Luther. There are 125 volumes of the Monumenta Historica. Twelve volumes of those of Ignatius' letters. A second, a second difficulty comes from the great range of activities in which the early Jesuits engaged. They dealt with kings and paupers, with the devout, and with public sinners, with popes, with prelates, with lowly pastors, with convents of nuns. They excluded no category of the laity from their ministry. By 1565, about a decade after his death, they were active in many countries of Western Europe, but also in Brazil, in India, in Japan, elsewhere. They preached, taught catechism, proposed new sacramental practices, and sought to help orphans, prostitutes, prisoners. They developed patterns of piety that were peculiarly their own, no matter how traditional the elements upon which they drew. 
They appropriated both scholastic and humanistic learning. They tried to relate these two cultures to one another. They wrote plays. They were present at the Council of Trent. They engaged in polemics with Protestants. And to their dismay, found themselves caught in controversies among Catholics. They supported various inquisitors and inquisitions, yet sometimes found themselves the object of inquisitorial scrutiny and censures. They taught in universities. Within six or seven years, seven or eight years, I suppose, of their papal approval, they founded and operated schools. The materials uh, have been known for a long time. Uh, the spiritual exercises, about which more in a minute. The formula of the Institute, which was like the rule of the older orders, what they were, thought they were doing. The constitutions. Printed in Latin after Ignatius' death, his autobiography, and particularly his correspondence, which is only now being worked on much more carefully. And there are purple passages uh, everywhere about them. They have their enemies and their friends. There's a current uh, English historian who says, they have been obeying courtiers in Paris, Peking and Prague, telling kings when to marry, when and how to go to war, serving as astronomers to Chinese emperors, or as chaplains to Japanese armies invading Korea. As might be expected, they have dispensed sacraments and homilies and they've provided education to men as various as Voltaire, Castro, Hitchcock and Joyce. There have also been sheep farmers in Quito, hacienda owners in Mexico, wine growers in Australia, plantation owners in the antebellum United States. The society would flourish in the worlds of letters, the arts, music and science, theorising about dance, disease and the laws of electricity and optics. Jesuits would grapple with the challenges of Descartes, Copernicus, Newton, and 35 craters on the surface of the moon would be named for Jesuit scientists. And in lots of books you find similar paragraphs. I like the other end of the uh, spectrum. People that few have heard of or uh, Just do it quietly. One was um, Alexander de Rhodes, founded the church in Vietnam. He was probably of a Spanish Jewish family. He finished up in Avignon, which wasn't French, by the way, it was the Papal States. And uh, he wants to go to Japan, but it gets as far as Macau, then works in China, and eventually goes into Vietnam. And um, he convinces the Vietnamese, in quite a short stay, to write their language, not in ideograms, but in Latin script. First Asian language it is still used today, which is why, even though you can't understand it, you can read Vietnamese. He was excluded from the country after a brief stay, went to Macau, came back to Vietnam, was excluded again, walked from Macau through Albania and Persia back to Europe, then went back to work in Persia. Very successfully, the Shah going to his funeral. Alfred Delps, another one, who signed his final vows as a Jesuit with manacled hands just before he was hanged. But his work against the Nazis. And some years ago I was in Chicago visiting um, Peter Steele who was teaching there and he introduced me to this older Jesuit. They knew each other 
well obviously in the got on well and this man left and Peter said he's a professional beggar he said most days he gets the bus from here goes to the airport gets a plane to a mid midwestern city or town sees some people and begs but he's in charge of getting the money for the bursaries which support the students who can't afford the fees at Loyola Chicago, which isn't the most expensive show in town. That's what he does. And throughout our history, um, most people have been like that. Um, sometimes historians um, go over the top a bit. Uh, Lord Macaulay was writing a review of von Rank's history of the papacy. And he says, The order of Jesus possessed itself once of all the strongholds which command the public mind, of the pulpit, of the press, of the confessional, of the academies. Wherever the Jesuit preached, the church was too small for the audience. The name of Jesuit was uh, on the title page, secure the circulation of a book. It was in the ears of a Jesuit that the powerful, the noble, and the beautiful breathed the secret history of their lives. It was at the feet of the Jesuits that the youth of the higher and middle classes were brought up from childhood to manhood, from the first rudiments to the courses of rhetoric and philosophy, literature and sciences, lately associated with infidelity and heresy, now became the allies of orthodoxy. Uh, John and Malley, a Jesuit historian who's flourished in recent decades, has stated quite bluntly that most popular writing on the Society of Jesus, whether favourable or unfavourable, has been woefully inadequate. Scholarly articles and monographs of reliable quality appear each year, although not, perhaps not in the quantity one might expect until relatively recently, practically all the scholarship came from Jesuits. It's writing about 30 years ago. Generally characterized by technical accuracy, it tended to take up familiar and even familial issues and was relatively unaffected by the new historiography. He's talking about Hubert Chauvin and uh, his work on 16th century Catholicism, particularly Trent, and the practitioners of the Annales School of the École Pratique of Higher Studies. Even today, this scholarship is not always free of hagiographical vestiges, especially when dealing with Ignatius, for whom we still await a biography that satisfies sophisticated canons of scholarship. And he says there are many exceptions to these generalizations, and on he goes. Um, I've been reading some lives of Ignatius that I, I hadn't read before, and yesterday. Not top drawer, but they're, they're very colourful, and uh, some of them, some of them are uh, quite insightful. The one I like is Francis Thompson. You might know he's the poet who wrote *The Hound of Heaven*. He went off as a boy. He, he was born in um, Preston in Lancashire in 1859. The devotedly Catholic parents, both of whom were, were converts, his father was a doctor, and they moved down near Manchester. And as a schoolboy and as a seminarian, he was brilliantly clever, but nervously timid and hopelessly absent-minded. So in the end, they wouldn't ordain him. So they sent him back and he said, oh, well, 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 um, we'll make a doctor out of him. So he sent him to Owens College, which became part of the faculty of medicine at the University of Manchester. And paid his fees for six years, but he never went to class. He didn't like blood. <laughs> so he used to go to the public libraries and um, 
read any. Go to the cricket at Old Trafford. He certainly didn't know he wasn't going to Christ. And um, when he found out, sent him up to Glasgow because he heard that the medical degree there was a bit easier to get, but he didn't get to Christ there either. Meanwhile, he was addicted to Nardam, which was an alcoholic tincture of opium. He was very addicted to Nardam. You could buy it across the counter and he bought a lot of it. So he sold his clothes and he sold most of his books and uh, became so disheveled he wasn't admitted to public libraries anymore. Anyway, uh, long story, he uh, links up with Wilf Wilfred Maynell and then starts publishing. He's been getting rejection slips up till now, writing on dirty bits of paper. He's giving pens and paper. And, and he does this biography of the notice, which is a Stunner, whether it's the Vardhan or whether um, he's got mystical streaks that tap into Ignatius, but it's um, really quite clear. I'm afraid I've spent um, a good deal of my life reading a lot of anti jesuit material. Um, some of it from the French, some of it from the English. Um, You get their supporters who aren't all that balanced, as O'Malley was um, hinting. But you get um, the other stuff. This is a Spanish book in the late 1880s. The title, The Jesuits, Their Mode of Life, Their Habits, Adulteries, Assassinations, Regicides, Poisonings, and Other Peccadillos Committed by that Celebrated Society. <laughs> And there are many worse than that. Now, in the chapel, you heard a bit about um, Pamplona, so I won't, um, I won't go over that uh, again. It was a force of about 12,000 of the French against about 1,000 defenders of the Spanish crowd, crown. The uh, odds were impossible and prudent heads counseled surrender, but uh, that wasn't the way it went. I've heard so many sermons on Pamplona, I wasn't going to uh, mention it, but uh, it's in the title tonight, so there we are. Um, I still remember a lot of those sermons. It was the cannonball. He knew it was coming. The next sentence was probably, and he founded the Jesuits. And the next sentence was, they became the schoolmasters of Europe. And the next sentence, they were contending with the Lutherans. So, within a paragraph, it wasn't quite like that. Um, I want to talk. Um, about the way the early society changed in a very short time. And I think there are lessons for us there. And that's really, uh, if this time, which is not going to be, I was going to talk about um, Ignatius's letters, but that's another story. Um, The cannonball hits Ignatius. The French are good to him. Their surgeons operate. He's carried back to Loyola. Some accounts say it takes two weeks, some quite a bit longer. So he's got time. And this happens to lots of us. Normally through ill health, ill success, Ill repute. But sometimes we just get a chance to think of it. We're struck by beauty, we're struck by something, and it's a chance. Um, but there are 19 years between 
the cannonball and the acceptance of the Society of Jesus. And then there are 16 years of uh, Ignatius' service as the general superior of that group. Um, so just mentioning the places he goes after a year or so and more operations to uh, Montserrat, then nearby to Manresa. Um, we were talking at dinner, uh, probably a more significant experience than the cannibal. He has a, a vision there of the river which brings his life together. Goes to Venice, gets to Jerusalem. Uh, the Franciscans tell him to go after 20 days. Comes back to school in Barcelona where he joins schoolboys to learn Latin. Goes to university at Alcala, Salamanca, briefly. Neither of them very successful. Goes to jail. Uh, they think he's one of the Illuminati with some evidence. Um, then goes to Paris for about seven years, eventually to, returns to Spain briefly, goes to Venice hoping to um, move to, uh, to Jerusalem, but that doesn't happen. So he links up with his friends and they go back to Rome where they have to decide what they're going to do. They agree to meet each night for several months to talk about what might happen. They have a calling, but is it a common call? Or are they individual calls? Anyway, eventually they decide, um, 1539, that this it's called the deliberation of the first fathers. It's very significant. They write it up. Though we were weak men from regions far apart and of widely different customs, still the most kind and merciful Lord had brought us together and made us one. So we came to agree that we should not undo God's doing. That should embody that union and daily firmness bond through mutual understanding and fraternal concern. For even great hardships are working to better unite God and humanity. Hardships which would frustrate our best efforts if each worked to mine could surely be borne and overcome by our shared courage and our united strength. So they uh, go to the Pope who accepts their formula with a few little changes. And so in 18, sorry, 1540, uh, you get the foundation of the Jesuits. Uh, Ignatius's biographers almost invariably divide his 65 years into three segments of approximately 35, 15 and 20 years respectively. The second is the most vividly dramatic and appeals most strongly to general readers, which is why we got so much of it in the sermons. The first is uh, intriguing, but largely inaccessible beyond superfluities. The third is probably the most uh, interesting to historians, but very few others. That is, he's, as I put it to the community the other night, the routinizing the charisma. Uh, there aren't many founders of religious orders who then tough it out for a few decades to uh, see the problems. In but he did. Let me just take these uh, early Jesuits uh, up till the time of Ignatius' death 
and uh, talk about some of the changes that happened very quickly. By the time uh, Ignatius died, which was 1556, uh, the band of ten companions approved by Pope Paul III as the Society of Jesus had grown to an organisation of about a thousand members, of whom only 48 had taken final vows and 25 were spiritual congenials. The society was divided into some 11 provinces which included India and Brazil. A few Jesuits led by Francis Xavier had been in Japan since 1549, supplementing the five or six pages of the original papal charter of approval were now constitutions 30 or 40 times longer. But these basic facts tell of quantitative change and more complex organisation. So they suggest the sociological laws operative when any small informal bonding develops into a large institution. So the society in 1556 was different from what it was at its founding in 1540. And historians who um, note the increment and the more elaborate structure rarely expound on the implications. Sometimes they convey the impression that the society didn't change in any significant way. Uh, they recognised the Jesuits didn't undertake schools until 1548, but even while granting the schools a special importance, they speak as if there was just one more ministry added to an already long list. In other words, although they readily admit that the society had an immense impact through its schools, they never seem to consider until recently that the schools, in turn, had their impact on the society. They certainly did, but they were merely one of the factors that even before the death of Ignatius gave shape to the society in ways not anticipated. Now that's stating the obvious, but I think it needs to be stated because there's a thing in history that uh, a historian Collingwood used to call substantialism, which governs our thinking about religious history. It, it admits that changes happen, but denies that they change anything. The first, of, I've only mentioned four, the first of the many shifts of perspective, emphasis, vision that took place in society during Ignatius' lifetime was, um, was one that Ignatius uh, promoted but gave little indication that he saw them as changes. This, he was probably incapable of recognising them, partly because of the mentality unused to such admissions, partly because of the speed with which the changes were happening, partly because of the general ability, inability we all have to register and chart the effects our decisions are having upon us. The first change was the relationship of society to the Protestant Reformation, a change that, unlike the others, is now rather widely admitted. By historians. When Ignatius and his companions studied at the University of Paris before the founding, they had been keenly aware of the Lutherans in that city and the turmoil they aroused. But under the leadership of Ignatius, they set their eyes on Wittenberg, not on Jerusalem, where they were hoping to work for the conversion of the infidel. In Paul's Paul III's bill approving the society some years later, Protestantism was neither explicitly nor implicitly mentioned. In the confirmation of the bull ten years later, 1550, by Paul's successor, defence of the faith was added as a purpose of the order, a generic formulation that surely pointed to the threat of Protestantism. It was an important landmark. The Jesuits had, of course, opposed Protestantism from the beginning. That, that's not the point. The point is rather that as time moved on, that opposition came to be ever more explicit in their practical self-definition, in the understanding they had of themselves and others had of them. 
the process was gradual. For instance, in the constitution, it's not, till, not completed by Ignatius you know, till after the rule of confirmation in 1550. The opposition is only alluded to, rarely, and in unspecific terms. If you didn't otherwise know that the reformation was taking place, you would never guess it from the Jesuit constitutions. Nonetheless, Ignatius at one point towards the end of his life suggested that in retrospect he saw the founding of the society as meant for the confounding of Protestantism. After he died, some of his disciples like Geronimo Nadal found irresistible the temptation to compare and contrast him with Luther. And the conclusion was obvious, just as the devil raised Luther to destroy the church, God raised Ignatius and his followers to defend the church against him. So the idea began to catch on, even among Jesuits themselves, that the society was founded to oppose Protestantism, an idea that badly distorts the original origins of the society and its actual history in many, perhaps most, parts of the world. Ignatius was quite unusual in his abstinence from name-calling. By 1560, Jesuits fell into explicit vilification of Luther. It didn't occur while Ignatius was alive. By 1577, Ignatius was calling Luther a hog in heat. Leinos, who prayed for Luther day by day, and had said that heretics and schismatics had been scandalised by our rottenness and simony. Uh, he eventually said that Luther was perverse. Nadal was perhaps the worst and most consistent offender, for whom Luther was disturbed and diabolical, an evil and bestial man, a wicked, proud, enraged, drunken, and devilish monk. Subsequent historians emphasised how Ignatius, the former soldier, founded the society on a strict and prompt obedience, a discipline required for an order whose supposedly principal aim was to counter onslaughts of the Protestants. And this brings me to the second change. Evidence indicates that Ignatius, from the time of his conversion, 500 years ago today, until well after the founding of the society, was much more concerned with poverty than with obedience. Although he gradually came to realise how in his own life and then in the life of the society, the ideal of poverty radiant in St Francis of Assisi had to be modified, he was nevertheless captivated by it. Not until about 1547 does Ignatius begin to stress the importance of obedience and to describe it as especially characteristic of the society. In the next few years, a series of letters from Ignatius or his secretary directed to Jesuits in the Iberian Peninsula deal with the matter, reaching a kind of crescendo in 1553 with the famous letter on obedience to the members of the Portuguese province. The occasion for the correspondence was domestic disarray, not more effective deployment of troops against the Protestants. As has often been noted, military images practically absent from these letters. The problem arose because some Jesuits went to extremes in fasting and other penances in Portugal. However, the situation devolved into factionalism and defiance. The letters therefore give direct attention to traditionally recognised ascetical and spiritual values of obedience rather than to the urgency that the virtue might have the Jesuit ministry. In the letter of 1553, for instance, the Jesuit special vow of obedience to the Pope, a vow directly concerned with mobility for ministry, was not even mentioned. And that letter began soon to be read aloud on a regular basis in Jesuit refectories everywhere in the world, the only one of his nearly 7,000 letters thus honoured. The practice wasn't ordered or directly promoted by Ignatius, but it indicates a new prominence accorded obedience by him and by others. Obedience was now well on its way to becoming the virtue most characteristic of the Jesuit. 
The special vow of obedience to the Pope brings us to the third way the society changed during these early years. When Ignatius and his companions first envisaged journeying to Palestine to work for the conversion of the infidels, they had to reckon with the possibility that disturbed legal conditions would make the trip impossible, which in fact they did. The alternative was to put their ministry at the disposal of the Pope, since he presumably had the best information about where their ministry might best be employed. As is well known, the, by 1540, the alternative was articulated in the special vow concerning missions. Although the vow puzzled officials of the papal court, it was included in the approval of the society by the Pope. The first Jesuits seemed to think that by and large they would regularly, as individuals in small bands, receive pastoral assignments directly from the Pope. This would be distinctive of the way they would operate. Ignatius at one point around 1545, in fact, referred to the vow as the principle and principal foundation of the society. What this seems to have meant was that it was the effective means for accomplishing a mobile and apostolic ministry in imitation of the sending of the Twelve by Jesus and the pastoral ministries described in Acts and the Pauline letters. As the constitutions indicated, these papal missions were to be short, generally lasting no longer than three months. In the early years, some Jesuits received such missions, but as the number of Jesuits grew, the number of papal missions became proportionately insignificant. The general of the order or other superiors made almost all the assignments. This change was an inevitable result of growth, but more seems to be involved here than mere accommodation to new, numerical increment. In the constitutions, practically everything that is said about obedience to the Pope in relation to the special vow is immediately repeated about obedience to the general. In fact, that the fact is immensely important for understanding what the vow itself meant. But it also puts the general on the same level with the Pope, the deployment of Jesuits. An awkward sentence seems indeed to favour the latter over the former. The superior of the society can more easily and more expeditiously make provision for many places, especially those remote from the apostolic see, than would be the case if those who need members of the society always had to approach the sovereign pontiff. For whatever reason, Ignatius doesn't incorporate into the constitutions that earlier description of the vow as our principle and principal foundation. And for such a foundation, he speaks of it astonishingly rarely in the 12 volumes of his correspondence. It seems probable that in his mind, a subtle shift from the original understanding of how Jesuits would relate to the Pope had taken place. It was a shift that perhaps helps account for the tension between him and Nicholas Popadilla, one of his original companions, who seems to have clung to an earlier understanding of that relationship, an understanding that would allow Popadilla a certain independence of the general under the aegis of papal sponsorship. In any case, the assumption that the Pope would be the person best informed where ministry was needed was now challenged by the quantity and quality of information that poured into Jesuit headquarters from around the world through this correspondence Ignatius demanded of them. It's a very different situation from 1540. The fourth series of shifts resulted from the decision to operate schools. In 1540 such an option was not only not foreseen, but implicitly precluded by a number of other decisions. Through a series of small steps, however, the Jesuits moved to a point that in 1548, Ignatius allowed, or was persuaded, uh, to open a school for lay students in Messina, in Sicily. And the success propelled the Jesuits to take schooling as, in effect, their primary and most distinctive ministry. By the time Ignatius died, Jesuits were operating some 35 or more schools, that is about four a year they were opening. By the time of the suppression there were 800, I think. And from Messina, it's Palermo, 
Bendir and Cologne, they hear of it, they ask whether they can. Perhaps the most obvious change to the, the school's rule was to put limits on apostolic mobility that the Jesuits continued to prize. Ignatius soon learned that for many reasons teachers couldn't be moved from one school to another or to different assignments. Mobility was never an absolute good in Jesuit thinking, but now it had to compete with the reality of being resident schoolmasters. Schools were stable institutions to which the Jesuits now committed themselves. By the time Ignatius died, the schools had changed in practice an important aspect of the poverty he had designed for the society. As most members began to reside in the colleges, the endowed institutions, rather than in the other houses that subsisted on arms. In Ignatius' original vision, all members of the society who finished their education were to live in the latter. And although these professed houses were a cornerstone of Jesuit poverty, as Ignatius conceived it, even up to writing the constitutions in the last five years of his life, he consisted he consistently downplayed the founding of such houses in favour of the founding of schools. In a related development, the schools also influenced the socio-economic classes to whom the Jesuits ministered. Striking in the early years of the society is how, incons is how consistently indiscriminate the Jesuits were regarding the socio-economic status of those to whom they ministered. Although early Jesuit documentation insists on the value of ministry to leaders in society, it's perhaps even more striking in its insistence that Jesuit ministries were meant for all classes, for the rich and the poor, with a preference for those in greater spiritual, moral or physical need. The Jesuits applied this norm to their schools and would not undertake new ones unless they were endowed thus ensuring the poor equal access with the rich. In fact, however, when the Jesuits opted in their schools for the so-called Latin or humanistic curriculum over the vernacular curriculum, they opted for a style of education that didn't have wide appeal to the lower socio-economic classes. Their schools, and to some extent their other ministries, thus gradually began to be directed ever more to the middle and upper classes, not because of the decision thus to direct them, but because of a prior curricular decision to that effect. Historians sometimes exaggerate the extent of the shift in clientele, but there's no denying that it occurred. Finally, the decisions to operate schools in the humanistic mode profoundly affected the relationship of the society to learning and culture. The first Jesuits from the beginning wanted the younger members of the order to have a first grade education, but with the schools, came the obligation to train their members to teach what they had learned and thus to appropriate it in a, more, in a more profound way. Moreover, much of what Jesuits taught related only indirectly or not at all to the Christian religion as such. Some Dominican legislation of the period stipulated that student members of that order were not to read books by pagan authors or to learn secular sciences except by special dispensation. Evidence from Jesuit sources up to 1548 allows that they could have gone the same route, but thereafter, by force of their vocation as teachers of the humanities and the natural sciences, they moved in precisely the opposite direction. In the first several years of the society, moreover, some founding members were convinced that the writing and publishing of books was alien to their itinerant and directly pastoral vocation. Ignatius soon came from a motor of writing books on pastoral and apologetic subjects. Jesuits produced books along these lines, but once the schools were open, they began to write books on Latin grammar and rhetoric and prepare their own textbooks on the pagan classics. Some Jesuits had to teach astronomy, physics and other sciences and soon attained renown in those fields. The schools also brought theatre with them. And with theatre came music and dance and the large buildings the schools required led members of the society into a new relationship with architects and architecture. The, student, the schools were institutions filling a civic role and that gave Jesuits an access to civic life that their churches alone could never have provided. In a word, through the schools and because of them, the Jesuits began an engagement modern enough, at, modest enough at first with secular culture that became one of their trademarks. 
this engagement was more than a, a propensity, it was systematic. Not present in the first 10 years, it then began to be intrinsically interwoven with the very fabric of the society and became a constituent part of its character. For the Jesuits, the religious mission remained basic, but as a result of the schools, it was not divorced from a social and cultural mission, as some of the early Jesuits saw very clearly. I hope that my delineating those changes uh, demonstrates that the character and charism of a religious body is not fully captured either in its founding moment or its official documents. If we want to understand such a body, we must at some point descend to the lived and continuing experience and then try to discover a way its impact. We must then be aware of that such experience and decisions inexorably a part of it shape character and charism in ways not foreseen, in ways not always recognised when they happen, in ways sometimes denied after they happen. These significant changes occurred during the lifetime of the founder and to a greater or lesser extent with his encouragement. The society in less than a decade after it was approved was different to what it had been. I only learnt while I was preparing this that um, in the uh, last part of the Constitution's Ignatius talks about the qualities that uh, he expects in the general of the order. And he's to be prayerful, virtuous, compassionate, but firm, magnanimous, and courageous, not without learning, unswervingly committed to the society and its goals, a person of sound judgment. And the magnanimity was to initiate great undertakings in the service of our Lord and persevering with constancy where it's called for. What I've never seen before is that whole passage is based on a paragraph in Cicero. The Ephesians in which he insists that the person committed to the common good of society be ready to risk life and all worldly goods in pursuit of that cause. And besides courage and constancy, breadth of vision is called for in both texts. It's interesting that Ignatius in finding the best expression of breadth or vision which he wanted to be characteristic of every member of the society. He found that not in the Bible but in Cicero. I haven't time to talk about uh, the letters which I was looking forward to do. Ignatius in his uh, various capacities as spiritual director, as superior obviously. Um, we'll leave that to another occasion. But of the 7,000 or so letters, 900 and uh, something of them finish with the same words. I close by asking through his infinite goodness that he give us the perfect grace to know his most holy will and to fulfil it completely. To know, sentir is the word, to feel.
it gets enough. There are many ways, as I say, we could have gone. Um, talking about um, missionaries in, in North America having their toenails pulled out and the rest of uh, the saints, uh, the war stories about the successes, but uh, I hope that I've given you some insight into what we begin to celebrate. Thank you. seven or eight minutes for questions, observations. Who'd like to start? While others are thinking, Peter, uh, Philip Endine once said to me that he thought that Ignatius's ideas on discernment and government were very good, well-suited and well-tested in times of expansion, but not so good in times of contraction. Would you care to comment? A fair point, I think, yes. Um, I really didn't say very much about um, consolation and desolation, which is how, from his own experience, Ignatius worked out which way God might be moving in him and what he should do. Uh, the spiritual exercise, of course, again, which I haven't spent any time on, is, is, is based on that. Um, Ignatius, uh, to begin with, I think you mentioned his reading the, uh, the lives of Christ and the saints. Uh, I think he, they're just a substitute for his sugar. His uh, chivalry, and he wants to imitate them because, and he wants to, to do it because it's hard and because saints have done it. It takes him a while to, to sort that out. But I think um, Father Ennett's point is a good one. That, uh, it's a different story, isn't it, Wayne? I must say, though, that of the schools I was mentioning, um, Ignatius eventually insists that they be endowed. That is, he says, um, get the money before you open them. Don't take their word for it. <laughs> get the stuff. And all sorts of people endow them. So um, in places it's the, uh, the town, in places it's the duke, or in Vienna it's the king, or individuals or groups of individuals. So. Um, but sometimes they go under pretty quickly, and it's, it's not um, glory days. Yes, Peter, thank you for that. As you were talking in that, you made into the sort of forces play. I thought a little bit about Muhammad and the younger Muhammad and the older Muhammad and the Quran and, and the influence of that on how you interpret. A faith or a belief. Anything you say about the younger Ignatius and the older Ignatius, this question of constancy and training God? Uh, good question. There is a, a good deal written on um, the younger Ignatius, the younger he's 30 something, but his attitude of, of recognizing how. God works in the rest of it, making decisions, and then the later Ignatius, um, uh, with the, the hard decisions that come. Um, Tom Roberts, an English Jesuit who was the headmaster, he then went out to the Archbishop of Bombay. Um, he's very clear that there are the two distinct parts of Ignatius' life, and he says it's trying to blend the good features of the guru with uh, the good features of the commissar. And another Jesuit biographer um, talks about um, trying to put together the Quaker Jesuit with the fascist Jesuit. He sees those as two aspects of it. Now we all know Quaker Jesuits and 
we might have made a fascist <laughs> too. But um, uh, I was where I was reading that was interesting because um, Oh, that's right. This man is commenting on the Quaker Jesuit and the fascist Jesuit, and he said, meanwhile, real Jesuits in the real world have proved capable in various varying degrees of fashioning their own serene and productive syntheses between practicalities of organisation and subtleties of inspiration, between office and charism, between being a member and being a man. Um, when I'm talking about the, the two Ignatiuses, in recent, the recent decade or so, that's much less written about. I think because um, of some good work on, um, on obedience. But it's a good question. There's another aspect of the, um, uh, the Morisco, as they call them, the, uh, the Moors, because the Moors lose their last um, city in Spain uh, just as Ignatius is born and they're excluded, they're really told to leave the country, which doesn't happen. And if they want to leave the country, it's quite hard. Um, some of the um, early Jesuits came from um, formerly Jewish families in Spain, and uh, that label lasts through grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Uh, the second general lead, as is probably one with Polanco. Um, yes, uh, during Ignatius' times, uh, they're criticised for this by Cardinals and the rest of it, and he, he holds the line, but eventually in the fifth general congregation, both Jews and Muslims are excluded and not, um, not readmitted for many years because of the external factors, really. One more. Yes. Uh, one of the things that struck me in recent times about the nations is that he was actually an extraordinarily mystical man. And um, when we, we hear of the tradition of mysticism with Catholicism, you, you think of people like uh, John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila and those sorts of people. But when you look at his reflections on poverty in his diary, um, it's clear that he sort of was living within the Trinity. You know, he sort of, He's dialoguing with the Father, he's dialoguing with the Son, he's dialoguing with Mary, he's sort of, he's, he's learning from out of the maturity. And that's where he said that the, the, this was all his reflections on Colin, but that was a big issue for him for some time. And But it just struck when I started reading that. He's an extraordinary mystic, but, but it is often missed when, when we talk about Ignatius. He, He's more seen, I think, is often somewhat pragmatic and, you know, try this and if it works, well, we go with it. And, but he himself has this extraordinary, uh, he lives his life within the Trinity, is the best way I can express it. Um, it, is, it is prayer which comes through in the dialogue. I don't know what we've got more clergies on that. Yes, uh, there are a few. Um, I think it was actually uh, the book of one of them is called Ignatius the Mystic, and they talk about that. I come at it from a slightly different angle. Um, Patrick O'Sullivan mentioned to me once that um, in his 16 years as the general, and for a few years longer in Rome before that. Um, when he had to do anything, he'd walk and do it. So if he had to see the Pope or see a Cardinal or see somebody. So his living in Rome was, that was the way it was done. He didn't travel. Um, and this, when you read about 
how simply he lived um, in this small room, in this small room, and took his meals in a private dining room with whoever he wanted to see. Um, it fits in with what you're saying, that there are contours to his life of, um, of prayer. We, I don't think we have any sermon of Ignatius. Um, he doesn't seem to have preached as general. Um, his spiritual diaries only recently, and it's just notes for himself, he wasn't preparing for anybody, he just beginning to uh, come out in the dishes. Now you're onto something there. And I think his his men knew it too. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Peter's successor as rector and my predecessor as rector is Phil Uran. And it's my great pleasure to ask Phil to propose a vote of thanks. For the Jesuit community here at Newman uh, meets on a Monday evening for a mass and then for a drink and then on a Friday lunchtime for a prayer and then for lunch. And it was about, I suppose, a bit over a month ago that uh, after a few survivor letters from uh, the General on the one hand and the Provincial on the other about the upcoming Ignatian year, we decided we'd better at least discuss this matter. And, uh, <laughs> There weren't many ideas coming forward, I must admit. <laughs> uh, but then Frank came up with the bright idea that we should have a lecture on the actual day of the 500 years down the track. And they came up with an even better idea that the person to deliver this lecture should be Peter Lestrange. I mean, I was a bit taken aback, I must admit. I would have thought one of our spiritual, spiritual mentors, the like of Michael Smith or uh, Perhaps Michael Hansen, we might invite one of them to come along to speak about Ignatius and the cannibal and the way it's changed his life and the way it's changed our lives. But Frank was quite insistent it should be Peter Lestrange, and I guess that's because Peter and Frank were together for a number of years, as you know, in Canberra, and I guess uh, Frank must have, as it were, sipped of that wisdom uh, while um, they were together in Canberra and uh, I think he had a certain idea to put Peter on the spot, as a matter of fact, um, <laughs> to come up with many of these random ideas that he has about Ignatius <laughs> and give us a, a lecture. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted, Peter, and thank you very much for what you've given us this evening. I can remember sitting in the chapel. I came here in the middle of 19, you know, 2005 when Peter was still rector and sat in the chapel many times when Peter was uh, delivering a sermon. And he made occasionally an allusion to the society and to the nation's spirituality. And uh, I often thought to myself, I only wish he'd developed that in greater length. Well, tonight he has developed it in greater length. Um, I particularly uh, am delighted because this college owes Peter so very much. Um, and I can say that in a positive way, probably better than anybody else because I was the rector before Peter and I was the rector after Peter. And I know when I came back in 2000, and I say middle of 2005, this college was a much better place than it was when I left it in uh, 1990. And that was because of the, uh, the influence that Peter had exerted over those 15 years. As you all know that um, Jeremiah Murphy, who's the anniversary of whose death we celebrated last Monday, I think it was, was here for 30 years, or the second longest extent uh, as a rector, um, continuously is Peter, and um, he left a very significant mark on this college, so I'm, just, I'm really delighted that we were able to invite him back to that tonight and to hear him uh, give voice to that vast and background knowledge he has, not only of Ignatius, as we heard, but of various other characters that Alexander of Rhodes might be of Jerry Healy, I must admit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the way that he seemed to be able to move uh, in the chairman's lounge from Persia to <laughs> Vietnam, <laughs> and various other people that he met 
mentioned the, the wonderful story about Francis Thompson. I never knew about that. Might be to some degree of Tony Ruin um, and uh, the, uh, the way that Tony lived out his life. So I love those asides, Peter, but I also like the, the theme that you, you took, particularly the three uh, structural developments that you uh, enunciated in the latter part of the lecture, the understanding the way in which the society developed. Um, I'm sorry there wasn't more time to respond to, to agree to uh, Des's question about the mist, uh, Ignatius and the mystic. I always thought Ignatius is very much a pragmatic and uh, <coughs> negotiating uh, superior of the society. But uh, as Des said, we all, we all know it in principle. Um, he was also a mystic. So, Peter, thank you so very much. Um, uh, I, I wasn't surprised, but I was delighted by the, the range of um, uh, explorations you ventured into this evening. And I think it's been a wonderful way for us, certainly both at Newman and I hope for the province, to initiate this uh, 500th anniversary of the uh, Cannonball Incident for the Life and Civil Thank you. <laughs>